Overwatch's journey started at BlizzCon 2014. Did you guys play yet? Well, actually it started as a failed project called Titan, but we saw Overwatch for real in 2014 with a cinematic and gameplay trailer that would change gaming forever. Remember, this is old Blizzard we're talking about here. Every game they made was practically gold. World of Warcraft, Diablo, Starcraft, Hearthstone, they made fantastic games. People looked at this game as Blizzard's version of Team Fortress 2, an extremely well-known Valve game on Steam. Except, something was different. Overwatch was vibrant and colorful. We are Overwatch. The heroes and abilities were extremely diverse and led to tons of new playstyles in the FPS genre that we just haven't seen before. And this was evident from the gameplay trailer alone. The hype around Overwatch was insane. 2015 could not come soon enough. BlizzCon 2015 revealed more heroes and we actually got a beta. The, yes, the original Overwatch beta. This was a big deal. Hype was through the roof and everybody tried to play. Except there's only one problem. Not everyone could. Your favorite streamers were playing, but you yourself weren't guaranteed a spot. There was a lot of controversy over this issue, referred to as only watch. <laughs> Only your favorite streamers got to play Overwatch, is what that means. They already learned from this for Overwatch 2. 2016 came and boy oh boy, release dates were here. Just one week before Overwatch was launched, Blizzard released the Dragon's Cinematic. This would become famous within the gaming community. You've seen it, your friends have seen it, your parents have probably seen it. Some of the best storytelling and lore we've seen in gaming. Do it then. Kill me. The very next week, the game launched, and the reviews were unanimous. Notable achievement in multiplayer shooter design. All Blizzard needs to do now is expand on what Overwatch so varied, so rewarding, and ultimately another seminal. Overwatch would go on to win just about every gaming award, and it took Game of the Year. Overwatch. These were the good times. Everyone was getting into the game. Cinematic shorts were being revealed for different characters that detailed their backgrounds and gave fans more context to the world of Overwatch. Seasonal events were coming out with new skins like the Summer Games event. And then Halloween gave us Junkenstein's Revenge. When the hour grows late and the sun sets low, which was the first major co-op PvE minigame ever added to the game. This was exciting because Blizzard was setting an expectation for new content to be consistently added to the game. I did it! Oh my god, oh that my was god. sick! An arrow yes, through the face! Oh, we got the achievements! We did it! Two new heroes were added, Anna and Sombra. Sombra's reveal was an extremely popular set of cryptic codes and messages the internet tried to crack leading up to her official reveal at BlizzCon in 2016. You probably remember when this was all happening. This was a big deal in the gaming community. BlizzCon 2016 would pave the future for Overwatch. After the Sombra reveal, they announced the Overwatch League. Put it out there. Leveled it up. If you decided to push yourself to learn the game, you could have a salary contract to compete on an official Overwatch team. Anyone who slightly cared about competitive gaming was all in. This was massive. Franchise teams across the globe? This felt like the beginning of mainstream esports. Step aside, League of Legends and your organic growth. It's time for artificial hype. <laughs> we'll talk more about that later. But at the time in 2016, this was pretty awesome. Everything felt so new. This was the future. Overwatch was selling tremendously well. It had a big content scene. People were taking competitive very seriously. Tournaments were getting set up. It was all happening so fast too. It only made sense that Blizzard stay ahead of the curve and start the actual league, right? One year passes and we find ourselves in 2017. These are still very good times. The competitive mode is fun. Big streamers are breaking out. New cinematic shorts are dropping. The Overwatch League is coming together. Frequent hero updates. The game's in great shape. Blizzard also drops the Uprising event, which is a major content update. It was co-op PvE, and it was a story mission that you could play with your friends. Now, this was exciting. The future of Overwatch was before our very eyes. This is what Overwatch would become. There is always this lingering excitement that any day now, Blizzard would release that next big piece of content that told more of the story. 2017 was also the year of the loot box debacle. Thanks, EA. Star Wars Battlefront caught a lot of heat in the gaming community. Battlefront 2, the loot boxes contain star cards, which makes your Boba Fett fetter than all the other freaking Fets. By letting people with more money have an advantage over everyone else, Battlefront 2 transcends its Star Wars nature and becomes a simulation of real life. Why? And some governments began to investigate loot boxes as a concept in gaming. I personally never found Overwatch's loot boxes to be predatory. 
they don't affect gameplay, they're strictly cosmetic, and you get a free one every single time you level up. Which means if you play the game a lot, yeah, I have too many of these things. Also, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds launched, and this was the first time we saw big Overwatch creators try new games. For the most part, everyone had brief fun with PUBG, but still considered Overwatch their main game. Let's move on to what began a root of an issue in Overwatch. 2017 saw three brand new heroes, Doomfist, Moira, and Orisa. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, hey, Chad, she requires so much more aim than other heroes. So much more aim! No! Way. These aren't exactly the healthiest heroes for FPS gameplay, but most of us didn't know that yet. The greatest offender here is Orisa. Having a new shield choice would mean less potential time on Reinhardt and Winston, which were debated some of the best hero designs in the game, but they weren't quite enough to push the game over the edge into problematic territory yet. Halloween would also roll around this year with the exact same Junkenstein's Revenge game mode. Interesting. We were happy to play it, but we were hoping for something new. Maybe next year. Now 2018, the game is two years old, and the Overwatch League began. What an exciting time to be part of the community. XQC, Seagull, Carpe, Surefor, IDDQD, Sinatra, Shadowburn, massive names, all playing in the league. Blizzard and Twitch ended up reaching a deal last second for the broadcast rights. However, XQC didn't play in the league for very long. There was some emote drama and more that caused his swift exit. Rolled and smoked my doggies. The general gaming community also started to get a lot better at the game. The competitive game mode was really exciting. Game balance was starting to matter a lot more to the community over time to keep things fair. This is disappointing, and the second I saw this, it, 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 incredibly disappointing. That's that, 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 that like we should our our peers should should know better. 2018 was very much still the good times. Then a brand new hero called Brigitte was revealed. Just doing my part. This is the bad times. If you ask most people, this is when Overwatch began to struggle. Brigitte is famously known as the most hated hero in Overwatch, a support hero that, simply put, was just too strong. He can kill her in a blink? She can... She kills before she can blink. Yeah, you're not gonna get it. So basically, if you have a tracer and you stun her, you hit left click instantly and then you're left click. You, you probably can do it the other way too. She came fully equipped with a shield as good as tanks, healing output that made characters borderline unkillable, including herself, and a DPS output that made her lethal if you were within her close range. And to top it all off, a major part of her kit is being able to stun you. As you could guess, nerfs were required, but a lot of time ended up passing, and people became upset and vocal over the poor balance. This was strange because so much feedback was given to Blizzard, but changes never happened. So the delete brig movement, it's a bit silly, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen, or is it? You either had the brig on your team or you lost to the other team playing brig. Nerfs finally came. Hooray. But they weren't enough. They were needed again and again and again and again. It took years for Brig to be where she is now, and she's still annoying and playable. That just shows how strong she was on release. I wanted to go into depth on why Blizzard has had such a horrible time trying to balance Brig at all levels of play. Brig helped usher in a composition of Overwatch heroes famously called GOATS. If you don't play Overwatch, I'll explain this to you. Instead of playing all three roles, tank, healer, and damage, you instead only play two, tank and support. You play an extra healer and tank which led to massive health pools and tons of healing. DPS characters can't really compete with that. So for almost an entire year, the Overwatch community fell into what's called GOATS meta. The exact heroes changed a bit as time went on, but Brig would end up being a core member and provided extreme sustain. A new archives event would also arrive this year, Retribution, something new to enjoy. It's fun with friends your first time through, but these really aren't meant to be replayed a ton. You can tell these are some sort of tech tests that are scrapped together for the community to enjoy as an event. And these events kept a heartbeat of hope going in the gaming community. They were very much welcome. And that Overwatch indeed wanted to work on real PvE content. We wanted one of these as a full experience. While Overwatch was fighting a GOATS problem both in Ranked and the Overwatch League, Fortnite started to pick up a lot of traction. You probably did not expect this in the story of Overwatch, but it was very impactful to the Overwatch scene and people don't talk about this very often. Fortnite started the first mass exodus of Overwatch content creators. For the first time ever, we saw large creators leaving the game for good. 
It was so extreme that I even made a video covering this back in 2018. Okay, so Loser Fruit has switched from Overwatch to Fortnite. Looks like Tim is about there as well. Baz is switching. Rifty switched. Aimbot Calvin, we're slowly losing to it. Muselk, we've completely lost him to the beast. And then there's us. A lot of my favorite creators turned to Fortnite instead of Overwatch. That ended up being a pretty good gamble for them. Twitch introduced Prime subs and Ninja was playing Fortnite with Drake. Fortnite, a free to play game, was getting insane content drops on a more consistent basis than Overwatch, a paid game that's already two years old. People were starting to question whether they would keep Overwatch as their main game. This didn't really happen with PUBG in 2017, but people were beginning to worry. Tim the Tatman began to walk away from the game frequently because of issues with players throwing, and Blizzard's extremely slow process of dealing with them, even quoting thousands of players' matches ruined. Why did so many people have to have their matches ruined for a ban to be issued? But dude, like, and, and you got a fact getting in trouble because he's reporting someone for stream sniping playing Symmetra? I'm not interested. I'm not interested in playing that. If they can learn, if they can like take care of that or something, man, then I'd be more interested in playing it. But until they can figure out what they're gonna do with like an offensive Symmetra one trick, I, I'm not interested really. Here, let me show let me show you guys this clip real quick of Overwatch in its current state. Ready? Dude, oh my god! Stop it! Oh, oh dude, I'm done with my When I mentioned before the problematic nature of the heroes like Orisa and Doomfist, we have obviously Brig. This clip showed that all together they started to push the game over the edge. It was becoming problematic. Boy, howdy, does that look fun. Man, you you guys spam that I should play Overwatch. You're absolutely right. That's that looks so enjoyable. I streamed Overwatch when it was fun. Unfortunately, based on that clip you've seen, it's not fun anymore. I don't want to play that. Fortnite's content creator codes in the item shop made it more appealing for big talent to step away from Overwatch and head to Fortnite. We lost so many core Overwatch creators during this time. This was a time of uncertainty. Halloween comes around and we get Junkenstein's revenge again. Really? Three years in a row? Something can't be right. Yo, what's up guys? We're at BlizzCon right now. It might be kind of hard to hear me, but we just got done recording new Ash gameplay. Overwatch would also get Wrecking Ball and Ash as new heroes, but as a community, we felt like we were still missing something. New heroes were expected, but it didn't seem like quite enough to keep up with other games. It felt like Overwatch needed something more. Game updates were slow, and Blizzard's communication was even slower. Michael Morheim, the co-founder of Blizzard, then announced he was leaving the company. 2019 is here and Apex Legends comes knocking. This began another mass exodus of content creators and professional talent. Apex, another free-to-play game, has diverse characters and abilities like Overwatch, except it fits into the now mainstream Battle Royale game type. This was very appealing to the gaming community. It's like Overwatch, except free, and it's a Battle Royale. Goat's meta was still a problem this whole time. Why do people keep playing three tanks and three supports? Blizzard thought to themselves. Instead of fixing the supports and tanks that created this problem, they had a different idea. Greetings everyone, this is Jeff from the Overwatch team. We are introducing a feature that's gonna give you more control over your experience, and this feature is called Roll Queue. The 222 Roll Queue system. This was a system that forced comps of 222 in every single match. A system that finally brought structure to quick play and ranked. You picked the role you wanted to play and then waited until a match could put a team together of people queuing for those roles. And boy, oh boy, did we wait. Turns out, people really don't want to play tank, and this made queue times unbearable, especially in ranked. Skilled DPS players found themselves waiting an hour for a single match. This had to change. Blizzard eventually worked on the algorithm until they got the times down for DPS back towards the 5-12 to 12 minute range. But if you play tank, enjoy your 1 minute queue times. Why did the Overwatch community not want to play tank? So the DLC heroes, as I like to call them, aren't exactly friendly to tank gameplay. Constant stuns, boops displacements, and overall loss of your character's control was frustrating, so people didn't want to play tank anymore. Tanks only had so many options with their abilities, and they were like giant meat pinatas that just had to take the beating and hope their team could heal them through the nonsense. The Overwatch community didn't expect to be waiting this long to find their matches, and if you played Fortnite or Apex, you got into your games quickly. Frustration was growing. 
Overwatch would roll out another PvE event, Storm Rising. I personally had the opportunity to play this event at Blizzard's HQ and with Jeff Kaplan himself. And I always love mystery heroes. And then we joke around, um, mm -hmm. someday we'd love to make balanced mystery heroes. You know? <laughs> I'm a little biased in saying this one's my favorite. It's another iteration of the short PvE events. They're always welcome, but they're short. The fun comes and goes. Then it was time for the big news. A sequel. Does this mean Overwatch is back? Yes. Yes, we are. Did you like it? Did you enjoy? Awesome. BlizzCon 2019 reveals Overwatch 2, a game that is both heavily focused on PvE and PvP. The entire thing was leaked a week before the show. I can, from the internet, I can read everything I'm supposed to say from the last week. But you could imagine the excitement. This is the content the community waited for. Story missions, hero missions, brand new PvP features, all under the name Overwatch 2. This is an absolute surprise. How's, how's it really going? Good, to see, good to see you again. How have you been? I've been good. How have yeah. you been? How's BlizzCon so far? Fantastic. You did a really good job at the show when oh, you, with the announcements. You. Also announced alongside Diablo 4, this was a good day amongst some rather bad ones. BlizzCon 2019 allowed you to demo Overwatch 2, and I was lucky enough to be there in person and actually test it myself. The PvP felt similar, which was fine because... I didn't expect it to change much, and the PvE was way more exciting than the previous Archives events. Okay, this was a good start. We had hope for this game. 2020 begins the ugly. This marks the last content the Overwatch 1 community ever got. Echo was the last hero ever released. BlizzCon was cancelled. The Twitch broadcasting deal with the Overwatch League would expire, and YouTube reportedly paid $160 million to get the exclusive streaming rights for both the Overwatch and Call of Duty League. The Overwatch community wasn't too fond of this, YouTube streaming service wasn't quite as polished as Twitch, and on top of this, star Overwatch players were retiring from the game, there were less and less reasons to keep watching the league. Michael Chu, who is the lead writer of Overwatch, left Blizzard. This was a big deal and a sign of what was coming. We didn't know it at the time, but the internal state of Blizzard was rapidly degrading. Star creative talent began to leave the Overwatch team. Warzone releases, content creators leave. Valorant releases, content creators leave. The MVP of the Overwatch League leaves during the middle of the season to play Valorant professionally instead. When do you ever hear of a professional NFL player leaving during the middle of a season to go play in the MLB? That just doesn't happen. It was a slap in the face of the Overwatch League and it embarrassed Blizzard in the public eye. Free to play games with consistent content bled Overwatch of their player base, and queue times kept going up. The 222 roll queue system was turning Overwatch into a queuing simulator. Overwatch was four years old now, and it still had a price tag. Free-to-play games were crushing it. This led to an idea, the Priority Pass. Now, what Priority Pass is, is if you are playing an impacted role, and if we're being honest and direct with each other, that's probably the damage role, meaning that has the longest wait time. If you are somebody who has a priority pass, you will get a faster queue time for that role. So now if you do want to find a match in reasonable time, you have to play something you don't want to. In order to play something that you do want to, this system doesn't solve our issues. Don't want to play tank and earn passes? Too bad for you. Now you wait 13 minutes so you can play Soldier 76 for nine minutes. 2021 would be our first completely empty content year. Not sure I count a deathmatch map. BlizzCon comes back this year, revealing more details about Overwatch 2. After a year of going dark, they showed a ton of details about the game. This gave a lot of hope to the player base again. After hearing nothing for an entire year, this is what we needed. They announced that Overwatch 2 would also move to 5v5 instead of 6v6. One less player on each team. Overwatch 2 will be played with two teams of five players, consisting of two support, two DPS, and one tank. April would have the most devastating blow to the Overwatch community. Jeff Kaplan announced his departure from the Overwatch team and leaves behind just a single paragraph for a goodbye after almost 20 years of service. It looked strange next to Aaron Keller's full page introduction. Clearly something happened here, and to this day we don't know exactly what. Sometimes rumors surface, whether it was Activision's pressure or Bobby Kotick, the CEO of Activision Blizzard, or just disagreements Jeff had with the team. Nobody's really sure. 
Talk about a blow to the fan base. Jeff Kaplan was highly regarded among Overwatch fans and was seen as one of Blizzard's last good standing members from the OG days. Things got worse. Left and right, Blizzard began to fall apart. Activision Blizzard continues to do damage control as a reckoning ensues with them having perpetuated a culture of abuse, misconduct, harassment. Shocking and appalling news to break down for you today. A cascade of leaks and a Wall Street Journal article has started a avalanche of information that is exposing the truth behind Activision Blizzard's lies and it leads all the way to the top. Former and current employees came forward with stories of what internal Blizzard had become. These were pretty shocking stories. Things were ugly. Blizzard had gone from a beloved publishing behemoth that consistently created popular IPs to a hated developer that wasn't releasing content. News seemed to be coming out on a daily basis of another Blizzard dev that was no longer with the company. The development teams had massive turnover and the frequent change of leadership made content harder to make. And the CEO of Blizzard, Bobby Kotick, would become the face of Bad Blizzard. The controversy is still ongoing, and Blizzard has tried just about every PR try in the book to reclaim their once good name. They even went as far as renaming one of their Overwatch heroes, McCree. Renaming McCree is a PR stunt. Oh wait, what is that? His name was based on a Blizzard worker that was put in sexual abuse case. Jesse McCree was named after a former Blizzard employee who was let go amidst the allegations against Blizzard Entertainment. Now named Cole Cassidy, Jesse McCree would disappear from the Overwatch franchise. The Overwatch League at this point feels pretty hollow. There's not much excitement around the game anymore. The League is directly suffering from mismanagement of Overwatch. Viewership is down. The entire thing just feels artificial. Like we were copying other leagues that had organic growth and success. We hardly knew any of the players of these teams, and there's little to no effort from most Overwatch League teams to even put content out with the players. The League sponsors disappeared. Suddenly no more logos were on the website. How could the League even afford to go on? The Overwatch community had shrunk into a mere acorn of what once was a massive tree. Dedicated players and content creators held on to hope of more to come. 2022, however, brought signs of hope. Right off the bat this year, Microsoft announces they're going to buy Activision Blizzard. So today has been huge. Jim, the deal news of the morning, Activision being bought by Microsoft. This was really well received in the community as it would give an opportunity for Microsoft to completely restructure what was happening at Blizzard. <gasps> An Overwatch 2 beta? Okay, now this is exciting. Blizzard announces the first ever beta that immediately followed a secret alpha test that content creators and pro players were testing. You signed up to get into the beta, hoped the website didn't crash, and then waited patiently. April 26th came and the floodgates opened. And if you weren't able to play yet, you could watch four hours worth of streams on Twitch and get a beta key. That ended up being a big deal for the Twitch numbers, hitting a concurrent 1.5 million. You could say players were interested in trying this out. Overall, the beta seemed to go well. Players were open to the changes and popular creators seemingly enjoyed it more than the first game. But the game overall was relatively the same. The only difference was one less tank on each team. Some heroes were adjusted to fit the new style of the game. Arissa no longer has a shield, Doomfist is now a tank, McCre I mean Cassidy no longer has a flashbang. These changes I could take or leave, but they're not a big deal at the moment because they will change a lot before the game actually releases. I will say however, Tracer felt like she shot nerf bullets in the PvP beta. <laughs> She'll probably be adjusted before release. And with no ranked mode, most popular streamers went back to streaming Overwatch 1 while the Overwatch 2 beta was still live. And after the beta ended, the 2022 Overwatch League season would continue playing Overwatch 2. This feels strange. The gaming community can't even play Overwatch 2, but the pros are playing it on the main stage. And even worse, the pros can't even play Overwatch 2. The same game they're being paid to play. The only way they can practice it is if they're scrimming another team, so there's no way for a pro player to practice otherwise. One of the last recognizable players in the Overwatch League, Super, retires. Your average Overwatch player probably struggles to even name two people that play in the league now. And while this was ongoing, the Overwatch category on Twitch took a pretty heavy slip. The beta closed and the game wound up with less than 5,000 viewers. Just a few weeks ago, we had 1.5 million. Maybe people decided they didn't care about Overwatch 1 anymore, that they would just wait until 2 eventually was released. All the while, we're still waiting to hear more about the real sequel to the game, the PvE side. This is where the redemption comes to play. I'm overall skeptical of Overwatch 2, but Blizzard's track record of PvE games is phenomenal. Maybe there's enough of old Blizzard somewhere inside the company to get this game right. In my opinion, 
OG Overwatch is the best FPS game ever made, before these heroes were added. So I'm especially excited to see what fans like myself get after this long wait, and I'm really hoping this PvE pays off. And that brings us to today. Actually, I'm going to cut in here real fast before the video ends. I had to say just a few more things that I didn't fit into the whole timeline of this video. The first thing is that in 2020, and nobody really talks about this from the Overwatch community, we had to delete so much of our community's history because of the DMCA and Twitch takedown issues. Just about every streamer wiped their entire backlog of old videos and clips just for the sake of they wanted to keep their channel afloat and not potentially get flagged and taken down. Basically now, whatever we put onto YouTube is all that we have left of that. There were a thousand of memorable clips that were just deleted across all the big streamers of the game. It's almost like overnight we lost a lot of our history, and now we have to rely on whatever was uploaded to YouTube during that time. Another thing I wanted to mention was about the new maps we got over the years. Just like we got new heroes, we got new maps, which is overall a less exciting thing to talk about in a video when telling the entire story of Overwatch. But I think it's worth mentioning that some of the maps that Blizzard added actually were so disliked by the community, they had to take them back out of the game, and they've had to rework just about half of the maps that they've added. Oh my god, this is actually hilarious. Maps! Horizon, Lunar Colony, and Paris have been removed from quick play and related modes. Dude, but I can't believe we're removing content and it's actually better. This is amazing. It's been a pretty funny ordeal with those maps. I thought I'd mention that before the video ended, as it is part of the history of Overwatch. This is the current story of Overwatch through my eyes as a longtime player. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. And to all of you, I wanted to say thank you to the Overwatch players to those that have streamed this game, those have made YouTube videos and content around this game. Thank you to all of you guys for being an incredible part of such an amazing community. I just seriously love you all. Uh, this whole Nateson thing, this Nateson channel has been an absolute blessing in my life. You know, a lot has happened in the last two years, uh, good things, since I've made my last video. I know I was gone for a while, um, but it's just a blessing to be able to come back and you know tell a story of Overwatch, and I just absolutely love it. Thank you guys for watching. Have an amazing rest of the night. Take care.